Welcome back to Athens Happens. I'm Aiden McDougall, digital content producer for The New Political. And I'm Megan Taylor, digital content creator for The New Political. Athens Happens is a podcast brought to you by The New Political, a student publication dedicated to explaining the nuances of Ohio University, Athens, and state politics. You can find new episodes at thenewpolitical.com or wherever else podcasts can be downloaded. Following the 2020 U.S. Census, on March 2, 2022, the Ohio Redistricting Commission approved a redrawn map with 15 congressional districts, one less than Ohio had after the 2010 census. The Ohio Redistricting Commission, or the ORC, is a bipartisan group composed of seven members who are tasked with redrawing the Ohio legislative districts. This redistricting in Ohio has brought along many legal challenges to avoid partisan gerrymandering and led to multiple attempts to redraw these congressional maps. On five separate occasions, the Ohio Supreme Court rejected all redrawn maps proposed by the ORC, deeming all attempts so far unconstitutional. Today we're here with Ohio University student Taylor Schneider to discuss the issues surrounding gerrymandering in the state of Ohio. Taylor? Welcome back to Athens Happens, and if you could, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, I'm Taylor. I'm a third-year communication studies student here at OU. I'm involved in mock trial, ACLU, students defending students, and yeah, I'm happy to be here. The first question we have is, do you think Ohioans are being represented in a free and fair way based on the new districts? This past summer, I interned for the policy team at the ACLU of Ohio, and I was tasked with looking into prison gerrymandering. And it's something that a lot of Ohioans, including me, aren't really aware of what's happening. So you asked if I feel if people are being represented properly. I can speak on incarcerated people specifically, and I can say no, they are definitely not being represented equally across or equitably across the state of Ohio. Representation without population undermines the one person, one vote. So when we have people counted as residents of the place in which they are incarcerated rather than as residents of the place they call home, the place they're incarcerated gets an inflated vote. So somebody who's voting there, their vote actually counts for more than one person. Whereas the people, the places in which these people call home, which tend to be Cuyahoga County, Franklin County, and Hamilton County, one vote there is diluted because of this. And that also goes into federal funding when they look at how much money they're going to give a county, that these rural counties that have prisons in them have an artificially inflated population. We know that money is never going to see the prison or the incarcerated people within that prison. So then it has to come from somewhere, right? Therefore, it's being pulled from these larger counties and being filtered into these more rural counties with prisons in them. So it has a lot of different dynamics going on and a lot of different issues. But all in all, it's just inequitable and we need to start counting incarcerated people as residents of the places that they call home rather than residents of the places in which they are incarcerated in. Yeah, I mean, that's like something that I didn't even think about coming into this idea of redistricting. And because like that population is so large in like those counties, like you said, but then to have them counted in the constituency, but not that's not that's not where they're from is something that I totally just looked over because it's not a thing that I like dug into like you did, which is fantastic that we have you here for like that. But on my side of like what I saw with like these maps in itself is it's kind of a weird thing that we have to do in Ohio just because yes, we have 88 counties and the way that they're shaped kind of are generally more rectangular in their way. But to break it down on like the state level with um, all 90 some odd representatives we have and to represent all those people individually on the state level is so much harder to draw a map for because each little city or each big city like for instance Cleveland Columbus Cincinnati they're all big and they all spread through Cuyahoga Franklin Hamilton but they also extend into other counties as well and to draw that map and to represent that in a way that fits best is gonna have to be really precise but to keep it fair and free is probably a harder thing to do at this point in Ohio just because of how diverse Ohio's kind of become in like those cities I mean Athens included specifically because we're gonna have college students here that are voting here and that in itself is something that can be discussed later but 
it's just one person, one vote, like you said before, which is kind of what we need to stick to. And that incarcerated thing like that you fall, that you're, that you're focusing on is a whole nother aspect that I think is extremely important for redistricting in Ohio. Yeah, Taylor, I definitely have never looked at it in that perspective, but hearing about it um, is kind of just like a new light into another group of people who I think Ohioans in general are not being represented in a free and fair way based on these new districts. Um, I mean, one thing to keep in mind, and I know people say it all the time, but like voting is for people, not for land. So we have these districts and we have some huge districts and then we have some smaller ones just because of the population of the area. It's a big city, it's more of a rural area, so there's just land. And I think that's a big disconnect. So I don't know that Ohioans are being represented fairly with how the maps have come up lately. And I don't think we have a good idea of what Ohioans truly want based on the districts that we've had or that have come through the court so far. One thing that really stuck out to me when Taylor was talking about the prison situation um, is college campuses, college students, and where they're voting. So college students leave their hometown, they go to a different area, and they're spending probably around four years in that area, give or take, if they leave or, you know, whatever the circumstances, but generally four years, you go to a university. And universities push voter registration, which is awesome. Everybody needs to vote. Everybody's got to get out there. However, it also begs the question of, are those people being represented fairly where they are? So Ohio University, for example, Athens County is voting Democrat. A lot of elections were voting blue. That's how we show up. Athens County voters are made a lot out of college students. We have a huge population of college students who are registered to vote on campus, and then they are voting on issues for their time being, but then they pack up and leave most of the time, go back to their hometowns or wherever it may be. Uh, Whatever they voted on, whatever went into effect while they voted on those issues, whoever they voted for, those are the people that are left um, in charge or in powerful positions for the people where these are their homes. So I think a lot about specifically Ohio University and how Athens County is this little pocket of blue in most every election that we have because of Ohio University. And I don't I don't know that it's necessarily fair for us to then come make these decisions and vote in Athens County, and then we leave. I'm gonna go to law school somewhere. I'm no longer going to have to deal with the auditor of Athens, for example, since we just had that election. But the people who have made their homes here are left to deal with it. So I think there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different groups of people who are underrepresented or like you were saying, overrepresented in certain areas and then not counted for where they call home. We're in the position that all three of us are in with the research that we do and the studies that we look at in particular to where we can see both sides of that spectrum of representation. And to be in Athens County is something monumental in itself for elections and redistricting because, like you said, I mean, and like we've said before, and most people know, Athens is a blue dot and a sea of red. Southeast Ohio is typically very red compared to Athens and Athens County itself. And that is because of Athens and Ohio University and majority of students that are voting blue and voting here. And like Megan said, there are a handful that might stay. There's a handful that are from here that call Athens County home and Athens itself home. And I know most of us that live here kind of feel that way. But even on like my own personal level, like for the previous election, I was registered and voted here in Athens because that was a statewide issue. But when it comes down to representatives, I will vote back home because for me that feels more personal in my form of representation who I want to see because I know I'm not going to be down here in Athens my entire life. Mm -hmm. You saying that makes me think about it doesn't matter who or what background or what ideology isn't being represented. The point is that people are not being represented. You know what I mean? You know, the people in Athens County, the people that live here and call this place their home and have for their whole lives, they are not being represented. These incarcerated people that are being, you know, mis- displaced into rural counties are not being represented back home or in those counties either. 
So it just goes both ways. And in a democracy in general, we're all supposed to be having our voices heard. And so whether it's Republicans or Democrats or independent people, it's just nobody's being heard, period. I think I think something that we can tie into even both the university uh, or college students voting where they're going to school and incarcerated people, too, is I think for me, like, I'm from Brunswick, Ohio. So when something's on the ballot for the schools, like I'm not getting I'm not voting there because I'm registered to vote in Athens because I've registered to vote on big statewide issues like you were saying, Aiden. But then it's like the process of switching that registration because I do call Brunswick home and I think the Brunswick city school system is where like I would like to have a voice there. So I think it goes both ways or you think about incarcerated people who are serving a term, but they have families, they have kids from where they're home and they don't get to vote on those school systems. They don't get to vote on those roadways or whatever's happening like on those smaller levels. So I think exactly what you said, Taylor, it seems like the more we talk about it, like more and more people are not being represented the way that it's set up right now, especially with the gerrymandering and especially with the weird maps that they're drawing and they're trying to make all of these areas red which is fine if that's what the people want, but when you're doing it on purpose, it's like, what do the people actually stand for who are from there, who call that place home? And I just think we have no idea right now. And we're not gonna know. As long as it remains gerrymandered, we're not gonna know what people think or what people want. Well, I mean, on the flip side of that, what does this truly mean for like incarcerated Ohioans? Well, It's not even just for the incarcerated people that it impacts. It actually impacts the people that are living in these rural counties, and it impacts the people that are living in these bigger counties. And to give you all an idea of the counties that I'm specifically talking about, Lorraine, Ross, Richland, Madison, Marion, and Warren, out of all the whole incarcerated population, 50.9% of incarcerated people in Ohio live, not live, they are incarcerated in those counties. Those counties all combined only make up 5% of the Ohio population, like total population. So that's an issue within itself. And the amount of incarcerated people that say that they call one of those six counties home is only 6.5. So people are being moved from these bigger counties and being you know, moved into these more rural areas. And The numbers that I was finding, and all of this is my research specifically too, so these are all numbers that I've added up and found through different sources that have been available, but there have been millions and millions and millions of dollars that should have been going to those larger six counties that aren't. They're being displaced into these more rural counties, and that is having detrimental effects on these bigger counties that need those resources, that need that funding, because they have more people in those counties, right? But for incarcerated people in general, how we were talking about, we get to choose whether or not we wanna vote in Athens or in our hometown. Incarcerated people just aren't getting that choice, period. And that's just a whole problem. And so when they you know, have served their term and they leave and they go back home, that federal funding isn't there that they should be getting. And now they're counted as part of the population of a county that they don't identify with and they probably don't have positive associations with. In terms of the total number that I got when I was adding up, over the past 10 years, there has been about $866 million that those six counties that I was mentioning, those rural counties, have gained just by counting incarcerated people as part of their population. Like, we're not talking hundreds. We're not talking thousands. We are talking millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. So when I say that it's detrimental, I mean that it is incredibly detrimental. And then the amount of money that would have been given to those larger six counties is $383 million dollars over the past 10 years is how much money Cuyahoga, Franklin, Hamilton, Summit, Montgomery, and Lucas counties have been missing out on because of this problem. So yeah, it's very intense. Um, But we know that there's a solution is the thing. Like the law's not set up in a way that like makes this to where it has to happen. Counties can choose. So in Lima, Ohio, they actually excluded Allen and Oakwood Correctional Institution when they were redrawing their districts. They chose to do that. And so at a county level, it's something that can be decided. It's just not being decided. So 
which we know why. I mean, they're gaining millions and millions of dollars by counting these people as part of their, you know, population. So why would they? Why would they give up that money that they can get and that they can benefit? And it's just, it's a whole disenfranchisement. It's a civil rights violation, quite honestly, I would go as far to say. And it disproportionately has an impact on minority communities because we know the incarcerated population is disproportionately black. So it's having a disproportionate impact on black communities specifically in these uh, larger counties. And it's a whole distortion of local representation, which kind of brings back to what we're talking about redistricting in general. People's votes aren't counting one person, one vote. It's not even close. And we know that our incarceration population is astronomic in America, in Ohio, in every state in America. So this isn't just some a few people being impacted. We have so many people incarcerated. It's a lot of people being impacted. And we've, you know, we've tried, there's been federal action that has been proposed to end prison gerrymandering. It doesn't go through. Other states have honestly passed it and done very well. That's California, Colorado, Connecticut, a few others. Um, they implemented a bill that basically says we are counting incarcerated people as residents of their homes and it's worked well for them. So it's not out of our ability. And we've tried to propose bills they keep in Ohio specifically and they just get shot down and there's coalitions and grassroots organizations that have tried to fix this. They don't have the resources, they don't have the funding, they don't have the ability or the backing, which is very, very sad. But there are people who are trying to work on this. It's just, it gets overshadowed by you know other things. You listing all those counties kind of just sparked something in my brain. Um, like the way you're talking about it, you've got to think Cuyahoga County is like Cleveland, Ohio. Like Cleveland, Ohio, I'm going to go ahead and say is not going to vote the same as a rural area in southern Ohio. It's not the same demographic of people. It's not even close to the same population of people. They are not thinking about the same issues. They're not thinking about including the um, array of different people they have from different classes, from different socioeconomic statuses. You're not like there are just so many different things that come from an area like Cuyahoga County even compared to somewhere like Athens County. It's a whole different group of people. It's a whole different way of life, jobs, whatever it is. And so for those people to be counted in these other areas is kind of mind boggling to me right now. And, and it's not just Cuyahoga either. Blue counties are suffering while red rural more rural counties are gaining benefit and not small benefit, large benefit because a lot of people are incarcerated. I mean, I guess on the flip side of that is, if I heard you right, when you said that Allen County doesn't count their incarcerated people, I mean, I went to school in Allen County that, I mean, there's a Lima there, which in itself is a decently sized city, but nowhere close to Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati. But I also grew up in Bluffton, which is right on the edge of Allen County and Hancock. Like you are riding the line. The county line goes pretty much right down the middle of that little town. But but yet yeah, you have Allen County, which is the biggest city, and that's going to be Lima, and Hancock County, the biggest city, and that is going to be Finley. Both of those are two opposite cities in what they do and their demographics in themselves and have two totally different opinions for counties that are right up against each other. And to not count people in that and for those two red counties compared to what's happening in Cuyahoga, Franklin, and... Hamilton is such a weird thing to see because, I mean, I'm just a rural Ohio boy, so I don't have, like, that whole experience of, like, big cities, many, many differing opinions when you grow up in a small town and it's just everyone collectively has the same idea. But then coming here to Athens and opening up to so many other opinions and points of views is such a great thing that I've seen personally. But to have like that group just locked in to a county because that's where they're incarcerated at and that's not where they call home is something that I feel shouldn't be a thing that is happening because it, you're, you're not getting that representation of ideas, but it means nothing to how they feel and how they want to be represented as people just because they're in jail and we're just kind of stripping away that right for them in general, which like you said, is like a civil rights violation in itself. Yeah, no, absolutely. And to give more context, if you're wondering, you know, like how many 
what percentage of the incarcerated population is coming from like Franklin Cuyahoga Hamilton Summit Montgomery and Lucas it's almost 50 percent so like half of them are coming from these larger counties do when people are incarcerated if they are not a felon so they can vote still do they get to vote from jail or is that do we know if like people if you're in jail on election day do you still get to vote if I had to answer that question right now, I would say yes, they do not make it easy for you to get your hands on a ballot. I think you have to push for it. I think you have to ask for it. I think it honestly just depends who's your warden, who are the officers there. Do they want you to vote? Are they okay with you voting? Like, it's a skeevy political little system. Yeah, it's just through this conversation, it's making a lot more sense why there's even a division in the Republican Party in Ohio itself over these maps, over like what's going on and why they're doing it the th way that they're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Do you think we'll see a fair resolution before the 2024 general election in Ohio? Personally, I can hope for one, but like you said, with the division between the Republican Party right now, I don't think that's really gonna happen. Cause like what has been drawn, what has been revised what has been determined unconstitutional have just been maps that are so so close to each other that they just change one little line or just a little bit more here and there but don't take into account like taylor's whole thing with incarcerated people in ohio because to them that's not really going to matter you're just going off of the quantity of people and now we're kind of in a better place of reducing redlining itself, but to kind of doing that with prisons in itself because you're not you're not, you're not drawing that line based on race, but you kind of are when you're counting that many people of color who have been incarcerated just because of how I think our like judicial system is set up in Ohio and kind of how policing has been. Just from a personal aspect, I don't think we will really see a fair resolution. I think it'll just be drawn up and then just accepted because it'll be too late and we just kind of have to run with it. To answer your question, no, I don't I don't think that this is going to be resolved in a fair way and not even close to being resolved in an equitable way. By the 2024 election, absolutely not. By elections after that, I, I couldn't even tell you. I couldn't even give you a number, but I know that sounds very, very pessimistic, but I think even just the discussions we've had today have illuminated the nuances that exist, and there's way too many of them to fix in a few months. We've got this election coming up in November. Last week, we're in September, and they can't even decide on a co-chair for the Ohio Redistricting Commission. And then you look at it, and the five that have been rejected so far unconstitutional, we had a Republican Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and she was the one who was leaning with Democrats for all these maps that got thrown out. Now we have a Republican Chief Justice who, I don't know that she's going to throw out an unfair map or what way she's going to lean, you know? So we have this division, and obviously one party is benefiting substantially more than another party in the state of Ohio based off of the current maps and based off of the maps that they are giving to the Supreme Court to look at right now. So I don't think there's a fair resolution in sight, Taylor. I would completely agree, and maybe it's pessimistic, but I just think with what we're given, with all the intricacies that go into making these districts, making sure people's votes count, and then at the end of the day, you could draw a map up and somebody from one party is like, yeah, that would benefit us, so I'm going to let it go through. That's where I honestly see this going. And even, even if in a perfect little Ohio General Assembly world, the people representing us agree on something, that doesn't mean that that's the people agreeing on everything, right? Like, like we've already talked about, like Athens County, the thing that we were just talking about with students voting here or with incarcerated individuals. And I'm sure there's a bunch of other nuances that we could get into with like access to voting and all of those things that exist. It's, it's just not, it's just not going to be fair to the people. Even if Congress decides that they found something that they feel is fair for them, it's, it's not gonna be, that line for what's fair for the people is just much higher and we're not even coming close to meeting that. 
I mean, I guess this kind of leads into my last question, which is what is the best way you think personally to avoid partisan gerrymandering? But like, I mean, what are our options? I I mean, I would say you're going to have to look at it on the two levels that we kind of look at it. No, the three levels that we kind of look at it now for congressional districts, which we currently have 15 instead of the 16. But then also on the state level for state representatives and state senators, you're going to have have all of those maps and include all of those districts in itself into the quantity of people we have in the state of Ohio. And I think on the federal level, it's a whole lot easier to think through. But when you get to the state level, then it's going to be a whole heck of a lot more precise just because the amount of districts we have in the amount of people we have in Ohio to represent in each respective county, city, municipality, town, village, just all of it. Everyone just needs to be represented in a way that is free and fair, in my opinion. And I mean, I can just answer my own question right off the bat while y'all think on it for a bit. But um, I would say on the federal level, draw more based on county lines, but then also taking into account municipalities and uh, like city limits to an extent. Because for me, back home, Bluffton is concentrated into a little area, but it spreads out so far to what is actually considered Bluffton before you hit Lima, before you hit Finley. And in between those areas are also little places. I mean, there's Rawson, which is north of Bluffton. There's Beaver Dam, which is south of Bluffton. So to also include those in their own little thing on a federal level is a whole lot easier than a state level. And I think, but on like the state level, it's just going to have to be more precise because I think even in Allen County itself, there's a, from what I've noticed, there is a difference between opinions in Lima and opinions in Bluffton. Like drawing that line in between those would be fair, but then you're cutting Beaver Dam basically in half and it just all comes down to, however, I mean, I know people will specialize in this and that is just what they do, but to an extent when they do it, most of them aren't independent on making those decisions and they keep it very in a partisan line. And I think the idea behind the Ohio redistricting commission being bipartisan is a great idea, but when you are having people draw maps on either side of the political spectrum and then bringing them together and then being like, Oh, well this doesn't work out for my party. This doesn't work out for my party. Then that's when that vote gets split. So I think if you're going to have a commission of people who agree, make it larger than just seven. Bring it into, I mean, if if you even bring it to like the idea of having Ohioans vote on it themselves and make that a state decision, I know it'd be really complex and because you're not getting someone from Northwest Ohio who understands the views of Southwest Ohio. You're not getting someone from Northwest Ohio understanding the views of central Ohio. Like that's just, it's, it's just going to be a whole different ball game when you're going at the state level. But I think federal level is a whole lot easier to to draw in a less gerrymandered way because I mean, again, back to where like I grew up was still kind of is Ohio district four, but how it was shaped like a fish hook through the state of Ohio, like on the very far left of that fourth district was Allen County, but then it skirted all the way up. It went around and above Columbus and then skirted all the way up to Lake Erie. And collectively, all of our opinions are different in every single county that that hit and every single town that that hit compared to what it was in just Northwest Ohio. I don't, me personally, I don't have the end all solution to it. I think there are a thousand different ways to do it and each way seems to have benefits and drawbacks to it. But I, one thing I do know is the way that it is now is simply not fair. Like you were saying, we're cutting counties in half. We're set, we're cutting cities in half. If you live on one half of a city, you have a, def, a different representative in 
Congress than somebody who lives at the other end of the city could have. And that's not... That's not a fair way to represent them in any way. I mean, yes, areas have many different viewpoints, a lot of people coming from a lot of uh, different political standpoints. But I think at the end of the day, cutting certain counties, I'm looking at a map right now, there, there's nothing cohesive about this. There are counties being cut literally directly in half. One, I guess, something to consider that I think should be considered is keeping counties at least in the same district, keeping counties cohesive, not breaking it up so that you're like, like we've been talking about today, especially with you, Taylor, about incarcerated people is funding and money and issues that are being voted on in one county. And people who live there or call that home are not having a say strictly based on the way that the map is drawn or based on the fact that they are incarcerated. And so I'm looking at this map and counties are being cut in half. These are counties where they're sharing the, you gotta go into another district just to go to your grocery store. That matters that those people are being split up in terms of representation, in terms of where the money's going or who they're, uh, where they're being counted on the census. Be- those are the cohesive units, you know? I, you can also look at it in Franklin County is like, very weirdly distributed across the districts. And it's like, okay, everybody in Franklin County won't have the same idea, won't want the same thing, but they should at least be counted for in the same unit. That's their county. That's their school system. That's the roadways they're using. Those are the stores and businesses that they are going to. So, yeah, yeah, I think it just has to, it has to start at least with keeping counties together. And like you were saying, Aiden, I don't think seven people, seven bipartisan people are even close to representing what Ohioans want at all. Seven people is not going to make the fairest map for all of Ohio, for all of what Ohio wants. But I just don't know the next step or what you can do to make sure that more people are being counted. I'm looking at the old map from before they're trying to redistrict and everything. Meigs County, which is right across, right by us here in Athens, okay, is counted in the same district as Mahon- as part of Mahoning County, which is three hours and 13 minutes away. You have a district that goes all along the eastern border of the state of Ohio. I don't think that I could confidently say that all of those people's views are being fairly represented. Looking at the map, like, not only is it weird, it's strategic. It's so incredibly strategic. And there's room for them to be able to do that because there is not clear redistricting criteria. If we had clear criteria that prioritized equal population size or district being geographically connected or, you know, being relatively compact in shape and having respect for, you know, communities of interest, like none of those things are set in place. And we were talking about potential solutions. I mean, a constitutional amendment that actually laid out those criteria would be awesome. I know that feels very intense, but I'm all for you know advocating for constitutional amendments because I do think that they can be um, they can be done as we've seen, um, and they can be very very effective. But that strategy comes into place, and the reason why they're able to be skeevy and you know putting those politics above the voices of the people. The reason why they're able to do that is because they have room to do that because no one's telling them they can't because it's not written anywhere that they can't. And until it is written anywhere that they can't, they're going to keep doing it over and over and over and over. So something has to be done, whether it is a constitutional amendment, whether it's something else, whether it's us advocating in the streets and screaming at the top of our lungs. I don't know what it is, but it has to be something or they are going to keep using their autonomy and they're going to keep abusing the power that they have. And just to like clarify with like this group of seven members that are on this Ohio Revision Committee, it is our state auditor, our state Senate minority leader, our state Senate majority whip, our state rep minority leader, our governor, uh, Representative Jeff LeRae, and our secretary of state. Those are the seven people that are in charge of that, which in itself is a bipartisan group, but it is bipartisan in the way of five to two. Hmm. Very, very even split. Also, those are the people that 
their jobs are on the line if people do not vote for them. So they quite frankly cannot put themselves out of the equation because their jobs and their livelihoods depend on the way these lines are drawn. I'm going to have to go on the record saying that I don't think you can call it a bipartisan group when the governor of the state of Ohio is on the committee. Well, Taylor, we want to thank you for being here and thank you for all the great information that you brought to us and the great discussion that we had today about everything. So thank you. And with that, and that's a wrap for this episode of Athens Happens. If you're interested in joining the new political, come see us in the radio, television, communications building on Sundays from 7 to 8 p.m. Also, make sure to check out thenewpolitical.com for more podcast episodes and other content. And until next time.